Shalom everybody. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of the Covenant videos and one of our sisters, Becky, asked me when I was I going to do another one. And um, it takes a lot of hours to work on this and I can put it together and do about a two hour class on it. So you can definitely break this down and watch uh, an hour or 30 minutes at a time if you want and just come back to it. I know there's a lot of material here, a lot of information and some of it is like stuff you got to chew on some, and uh, you don't have to consume it all at one time. If it's overwhelming, definitely put it away and come back to it. Um, and then if this is not your thing, you don't have to watch it. It's all your choice. But uh, I do believe that this is restored truth that Yahuwah is bringing and revealing to us in His Word. It is, it is duplicatable. You can study it yourself and get... Uh, similar results depending on what he's going to reveal in your study uh, maybe more and definitely maybe maybe different stuff as well as he shines a light on different aspects of this that I'm bringing forward in truth this is what he showed me in my study and used the things that he's put into me what he's built into me and in, in my history and life um, I worked 30 years uh, 30 years in the television industry, and so you'll see some reflections of what you was put into me and, and the things that he's brought me through and the things that he's made me aware of in my life. This is part of, of my life, and, this, and the, my study will be somewhat a reflection of, of the experience he's given me in my life, but it's still truth and he can share with you his truth through what he's put into your life as well. So let's just pray and get started. Abi Yahuwah, I just thank you for this opportunity to come together with your people and to share your restored truth to us. And we thank you for your word and that it is a roadmap for us to make sure that we are on that narrow path that you've called us to live in and to walk and we ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand and be uh, subservient to you in your way father and we ask you to allow us to return to your true path the ancient path that you asked us to seek after and to inquire of and we thank you for meeting all of our needs and providing the truth for us to walk in. In Yahushua's name, we pray. Amen. Okay. Man desires religion, but Yahuwah desires covenant relationship. By the way, on Facebook, if you are seeking truth, I welcome you to a friendship if we're not already friends. And this is in my notes on Facebook. I have a lot of notes there to share truth. Restoration 3, Covenant in the Scriptures, Part 2. Before we get into the Part 2 of our covenant study, I had it on my heart to share some thoughts and quotes about truth, perceived truth, and non-truths. No lie can stick without being attached to a truth. It just cannot be believed nor deceive others unless it's attached to the truth. There are many movies about perceived truth, about lying, and about deception. I picked three movies to bring up as some quick examples, some pretty uh, popular movies. One movie about deception is The Truman Show. Wiki says, The Truman Show is a 1998 American satirical dystopian comedy drama film which chronicles the life of a man who is initially unaware that he is living in a constructed reality television show broadcast around the clock to billions of people around the globe. Truman becomes suspicious of his perceived reality and embarks on a quest to discover the truth about his life. So this is Jim Carrey, of course, the actor. Another classic movie about deception and the participants being unaware is the famous Matrix movie. According to Wiki, The Matrix is a 1999 American-Australian neo-noir science fiction martial arts film. It depicts a dystopian future in which reality, as perceived by most humans, is actually a simulated reality called The Matrix, created by sentient machines to subdue the human population while their bodies heat 
and electrical activity are used as an energy source. Computer programmer Neo learns this truth and is drawn into a rebellion against the machines, which involves other people who have been freed from the dream world. That's an interesting word, dystopian. It's used to describe both movies. Isn't that interesting? It means an imagined place or state in which everything is unpleasant or bad, typically a totalitarian or environmentally degraded one. It is the opposite of a utopian world. Let's check one more movie, Inception. Wiki tells us Inception is a 2010 science fiction heist thriller film with a large ensemble cast. In the movie, Leonardo DiCaprio plays a professional thief who commits corporate espionage by infiltrating the subconscious of his targets. He is offered a chance to have his criminal history erased as payment for a task considered to be impossible. Inception is the implantation of another person's idea into a target's subconscious mind. I just looked at some quotes about lying and truth. Let's check them out, too. So you're always honest, I said. Aren't you? No, I told him. I'm not. Well, that's good to know, I guess. I'm not saying I'm a liar, I told him. He raised his eyebrows. That's not how I meant it, anyways. How do you mean it, then? I just, I don't always say what I feel. Why not? Because the truth sometimes hurts, I said. Yeah, he said, so do lies, though. That's by Sarah Dres Dessen. Just listen. Some people don't tell others the truth because they don't want to deal with their own feelings of potentially hurting someone with some truth that they assume the other person doesn't want to know about. So they refer to... They prefer, rather, to communicate with others on the level of what they think the other person is willing to listen to. Napoleon Bonaparte, history is a set of lies agreed upon. Very poignant and true. Written history is not only a set of lies agreed upon, but the victor in a war, the overcomer of a people, rewrites the history so that the people they rise up against and overcome forget what truly happens, and the next generation and subsequent generations learn what the rulers want them to learn. Let's look at the next one. But you can't make people listen. They have to come around in their own time, wondering what happened and why the world blew up around them. It can't last. Ray Bradbury, the author of Fahrenheit 451. Sad, but also true nonetheless. Anyone who believes what a cat tells him deserves all he gets. Neil Gaiman of Stardust. We could throw out the word cat and insert any other deceiving entity. entity. And Troy Miller from www.creationcalendar.com has some very good quotes. These are some of my favorites. Very memorable. Let's look. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. Arthur Schopenhauer, philosopher, 1788-1860. A true initial commotion is directly proportional to how deeply the lie was believed. When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous, and its speaker a raving lunatic, Dresden James. When a man who is honest mistaken when a man who is honestly mistaken hears the truth, he will either quit being mistaken or cease being honest. Attorney Richard Humpel. This site is dedicated to discovering and promoting scriptural truths that have lain dormant, neglected by believers, yet are as binding today as they were the moment Yahuwah's finger touched stone and later as Moshe's quill touched parchment. If you are ready to be challenged, remember the truth is stranger than fiction only because we have been indoctrinated with a lie. That's www.creationcalendar.com. Let's look at some scripture from Isaiah 55. little mouse working here. See, a nation you do not know you shall call, and a nation who does not know you run to you because of Yahuwah, your Elohim, and the set-apart one of Israel, for he has adorned you. Seek Yahuwah while he is to be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wrong forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yahuwah. 
who has compassion on him, and to our Elohim, for he pardons much. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares Yahuwah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from the heavens, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It does not return to me empty, but shall do what I please, and shall certainly accomplish what I sent it for. For with joy you go out, and with peace you are brought in. The mountains and the hills break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field clap the hands. Instead of the thorn, the cypress comes up, and instead of the nettle, the myrtle comes up, and it shall be to Yahuwah for a name, for an everlasting sign which is not cut off. When we look at the word of Yahuwah, it is true. Of course we have to deal with the translator's work. They don't always do the best job, but we can compare our restored name scriptures to check the translation, and we can actually look up the original words in a dictionary such as the one in our Strong's Concordance. When we have a good translation with restored name of our Creator, we have a translation we can work with, and we can study the original words as well. It's sometimes, it's sometimes hard, or seems hard, to share truth to people. People sometimes want to know what they haven't learned yet, but they don't want to know that about which they have been misled. And in this case, they often seem to have a very tough time receiving truth. Just by examining what you may not have ever studied before, there will be new things to learn, and it's okay. And if we want to grow in the truth of the word of our Creator, we need to read the word of Yahuwah, possibly wrestle with our discomfort, and then conform to his word. I would love to help you however I can. If you want the truth that has been restored to me, I'm going to share it in a loving way. And if you don't want the truth, go watch a video on what you like to watch. We're here to help, but don't shoot the messengers that Yahuwah sends to you. Recently I was asked if I would do a study on the second exodus. Well, I believe it is a worthy study, and I want to do it. But I felt that Yahuwah's Ruach HaKodesh, His sanctified spirit of Emet, which means truth, had suggested to me that I need to finish the covenant scriptures before we examine the second exodus scriptures. When the Hebrew people left Mitzrayim, which sounds a little like misery, and it means Egypt, following Yahuwah out of their house of bondage, a mixed multitude left with, uh, with Yahuwah, following Moshe's lead. With a strong arm, he delivered them from a world leader and his strength over them. But when they got out into the wilderness, all they wanted to do was to turn back to the life of slavery they, they had known. They did not want to serve Yahuwah, but other deities they had known in Mitzrayim. They loved that familiarity, and when they got to Mount Sinai, or Sinai, Yahuwah gave them the covenant, and the people agreed to keep it, both themselves and their descendants. But they continued to sin and to not believe in Yahuwah's deliverance, and that he was their mighty one, their Elohim. This Torah, which means instruction, was as a marriage covenant between the Creator and the descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We know we have known them as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was also a mixed multitude, including others who had left with the children of Yaakov out of Egypt, and they too had made their uh, made this covenant with Yahuwah. And Yahuwah told the people the blessings they would receive with keeping the covenant and obeying him. You can find these blessings listed in Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 14. And yet, there was also an even longer list of curses if they did not choose to keep the covenant. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 68. Yet they broke the covenant, and broke the covenant, and broke the covenant over the hundreds and hundreds of years. Many Christians want to know about the rapture. Certainly, it is what we have been taught. But did anyone teach us about the wilderness experience that the scriptures tell about? I don't remember being taught about it when I was sitting in a church for any of the 33 years that I was there. But then there is a requirement in the scriptures where the Creator lets us know that we should study and make sure that what we are being told, what we are being taught, is really what He says. 
When Yahuwah called Abram out, that was just one man with his family and all his belongings. When Yahuwah brought the people out at the time of the first exodus, how many people left Egypt? Some say 11 million, some say 40 million. Code Searcher thinks there was at least 20 million that came out. And they were brought out of all that they knew, and they were put under the bond of matrimony with Yahuwah, the bond of the covenant. The wilderness experience involved a rescuing, a wooing. It involved setting boundaries and right behaviors with a perfect being. It involved a matrimony covenant with the Mighty One who will one day again rescue us from all that we have known, and He will put us under the bond of the covenant and teach us truth. When slaves or prisoners, really they are both, are delivered, sometimes it turns out that they really don't want to be delivered. They have enjoyed their strange relationship with their captors, their guardians. They love their perks and the fact that their keepers do make sure they have all they need to get the people to serve them. The prisoners' minds have warped from knowing all that is right and all that is good. They don't really want, they, they don't really know what freedom is, nor would most people choose it. To free someone who has fallen in love with their captors, at least to the point that they don't really want to leave, perhaps, but just want things to be worked out in their favor a bit. But to rescue, kidnap these people. Rescue from Yahuwah's perspective, but some came to regard it almost as if it was a massive kidnapping. It ended up that only two of those people who came out of Mitzrayim were allowed to enter into the Promised Land. There was much for these rescued to be cured from. One source that I have says that the descendants of Yaakov had sunk very low in the depths of their sin. That's in the Stones to Not, intro to the book of Exodus. Fifty levels of sin until you get to permanent damnation. Anyone remember a recent movie titled called Fifty Sh Shades of Grey? That's what that was referring to. So as we look forward to a rescue, we have to deal with the one with whom we must deal. This one wants a covenant marriage with his people. And being a loyal spouse means we must turn from all that is not from him. We need to be using this time to prepare for him, calling us out of all that we know and being swept off our feet by him. How well do we know Yahuwah? Will we choose him over all we have known? over all we have learned that is not from him? How do we know what is from him? Have we been taught his truth? There we go back, full circle, to studying, studying his word. But it's not just studying, it's seeking the truth. It's a mission to not fall for the deceptions of the enemy. It's a call to wake up and be sober-minded and to seek the narrow path, not the wide road that leads to destruction that everybody else is on. We have to believe these words of Yahushua, right? Well, so that's what we'll do. We will continue our study of this covenant that he is going to call us to. And we will begin now with Abraham being called into covenant with Yahuwah. In part one, we read about the land covenant that Yahuwah entered into with Abraham and his descendants. It's been a while since I recorded this. So go back and look through Code Searcher's videos until you find Restoration 3, part one, covenant to review that. Most scriptures believing people have no problem with mentally adopting Abraham as their great 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 granddaddy. The scriptures even tell us we are adopted into Yashorel, the family of Yaakov, if we have made the living Torah our Mashiach, Yehushua, our Mashiach. But there is actually scriptural evidence that the fullness of the Gentiles, Milo HaGoyim in Hebrew, that's in Genesis 48:19, is the ten northern or hidden tribes known as the house of Ephraim or the house of Yashorel or Yisrael or Israel. We have also read from Stephen M. Collins' book on our um, live streams, um, Israel's tribes today and showed where Mr. Collins believes the tribes are today. You can check out our Saturday night live streams for, for those few videos or just search for his book or videos and study up. There are many biological heirs of Abraham through Yitzhak and through Yaakov. Those who love the Creator and many who do not are the biological heirs of Abra, Abraham. 
So you can dare to believe that you are an heir of Abraham, either physically a direct descendant or by adoption, and that this is your great-granddaddy, and that covenants made with Abraham by Yahuwah were for your benefit, if you agree to the terms of the covenant. We laid a lot of background info in the last video. We introduced to Abram, who in a couple of chapters will get his name changed to Abraham. And today we will look at the covenants initiated by Yahuwah and entered into with Abram, or Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This picture is showing the, the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire. And so it is here that we begin today, looking at Bereshit, um, which is the Hebrew book that means in the beginning, and it's translated as Genesis. And we're going to look at chapter 15. So here we have a, a portrait or picture of um, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And originally they were called Abram and Sarai. Genesis 15. After these events, the word of Yahuwah came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. And Abram said, Master Yahuwah, what would you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, See, you have given me no seed, and see, one born in my house is my heir. And see, the word of Yahuwah came to him, saying, This one is not your heir, but he who comes from your own body is your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heavens, and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, See, uh, he said to him, So are your seed. And he believed in Yahuwah, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahuwah who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Master Yahuwah, whereby do I know that I possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a, a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took all these to him and cut them in the middle and placed each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Pull that up so it's kind of nice just to look at it. And then let some sort of visual, so um, let's get some sort of visual so we can have an idea of what a three year old heifer, a three year old she goat, and a three year old ram look like. Here's a three year old heifer and a three year old she goat. This is one of our goats. She's talking to us there. This is Ella. And here's a three-year-old ram. And here's a turtle dove. Looks like a turtle, turtle's back. And here's a young pigeon. As we're going through these things, we need to ask ourselves, in our day, where people are about human animal rights, rather, about animal rights and are against animal sacrifices, thinking them cruel, evil, and barbaric. And for that matter, many people are also against obedience and they want to serve their mighty ones, their deities, in their own ways, or just celebrate how awesome they are with no mighty one, and they just do not want to be told what to do. If Yahuwah, the Creator, who had just called out to you and told you to leave all that you have known and follow Him to a land He would lead you to, such as happened with Abram and his family, and now he asked you to do this. Would you do it? I'm asking because he did ask our grandfather to do it. Okay, let's continue with the chapter and see what happened next. And he took all these things to him and cut them in the middle and placed each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down on the carcasses and Abram drove them away. And it came to be when the sun was going down and a deep sleep fell upon Abram that sea a frightening dark, great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. But the nation whom they serve I am going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you are to go to your fathers in peace. You are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here. 
for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to be when the sun went down, and it was dark, that see a smoking oven and a burning torch pass, passing between those pieces. On the same day Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram, saying, I have given this land to your seed, from the river of Mitzrayim to the great river, the river Euphrates, with the Canite and the Kenizzite and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim, and the Amorite and the Kenanite, and the Girgashite and the Yebusite. When the crookedness of the Amorites was complete, when the crookedness of the Amorites was complete, when the crookedness of the Amorites was complete, the Hebrews would come to their land. And we are told that this would happen in the fourth generation. 430 years after Yitzhak was born, I understand that where he was born belonged to Egypt at that time. When the Hebrews did move into the land, they did not take over all that Yahuwah said that they would take, so there is yet a future fulfillment. Here's a map of the 12 tribes of Israel around 1200 to 10, uh, 1050 BC, according to the book of Yahushua. So you can see all the tribes here. Now, I don't remember exactly where all of them are nowadays, but I believe that um, Ephraim here, it, the oldest, or the one that had the birthright of the, the children of Yosef, Ephraim, in the beige color, that was, um, that ended up being the United Kingdom and all of its different countries like um, Australia and New Zealand and a good part of Canada. And then Menashe ended up being the United States. They've got a wide open area and we have a wide open area here now. So Menashe is those of us who live in the United States. That's us. That's the tribe. Um, the one that says Manasseh. Okay. And then Reuben, there you can see on the bottom right, Reuben is France, and um, Yehuda is over in Israel now, um, and I believe that the tribe of God was in South Africa. Uh, Don, we usually say is Dan, Don is like Denmark, and those uh Danish areas, the Danube, all of those were where, where the tribe of Don landed. Um, Yisachar is what you see it's written there, Yisachar. Yisachar is the Scandinavian countries. And the other three, I can't, let's see, we've got, we've got Simeon in here somewhere. There's Simeon in, inside Yehuda. Um, and Louis doesn't have a, a home. Um, those are living among the tribes, Simeon and Louis. And I believe that Louis and Simeon were, were said in the book to be a lot of our lawyers and police, things like that, and um, also our entertainers. The musicians come from those tribes. And I don't recall where the other ones were found. Let's see, one of them, you know what, I'm wrong. Uh, God, I believe, is Germany. Well, anyway, just go through the book that we just went through the last chapter of Israel's Tribes Today. And, and also you can go through our live stream. But uh, we, we went through all of these tribes, and uh, it's, it's hard for me to remember where all 12 of them are. But you can definitely check it out in our live stream where we read through that one chapter over about three or four weeks. This map shows where the 12 tribes settled. This is not all that Yahuwah has promised us, so we should pay attention to things happening between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates, like today in the news and stuff. That would be land that will go back to the tribes. According to Wiki, this is known as the covenant of the pieces or the covenant between the parts. It was an important event in the scriptural story of the patriarch Abram. In this event, Yahuwah revealed himself to Abram and made a covenant with him at the site known nowadays as Mount Betarim, in which Yahuwah announced to Abram 
that his descendants would eventually inherit the land of Yasharel. This was the first of a series of covenants made between Yahuwah and the patriarchs. So the covenant between the parts of the covenant of the pieces was an unconditional land covenant. Okay, let's move on to Bereshit, or in the beginning, also known as Genesis 17. I'm going to cover another covenant. I'm going to grab drink water. And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. And I gave, I, and I give my covenant between me and you and, and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, as for me, look, my covenant is with you and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham because I shall make you a father of many nations, and I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly, and make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come from you, and I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you, in their generations for an everlasting covenant, in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be Elohim to you, and your seed after you. And I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I shall be their Elohim. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for you, guard my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you guard between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you is to be circumcised. So Yahuwah told Abraham, I shall establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, and shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession. So who does it belong to? It belongs to the children of Yaakov and Yitzhak and, and Abraham. And I shall be their Elohim. But now, if you're a pre- trib rapture believer you should be trying to render this in your mind as to how all this plays out where do you fit that pre-trib rapture in with this land that's an everlasting possession this is my covenant which you guard between me and you and your seed after you every male child among you is to be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you and a son of eight days is circumcised by you. Every male child in your generations, he who was born in your house or bought with silver for, from any foreigner who is not of your seed, he who was born in your house and he who was bought with your silver has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, do not call her name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. And I shall bless her and also give you a son by her. And I shall bless her and she shall become nations, sovereigns of peoples, are to be born, are to be from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Is a child born to a man who is a hundred years old? Or is Sarah who is ninety years old to bear a child? In actuality, both Abraham and Sarah laughed when Yahuwah gave them the word over two different occasions. And so his name was Laughter. Yitzhak means laughter. Beginning in verse 10, this is my covenant, which you guard, which you guard, which you guard between me and you. Are we guarding this covenant? Every male child is to be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And an uncircumcised male, moments away, okay, moments away here.
Jonathan. Does this go to the top right? Oh, I couldn't find it. Yep, that's why I hate. Anyway. Every male child is to be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. This covenant goes in the flesh. And an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, so um, before I go on, I wanted to point out that I think it's interesting that uh, many Christian mothers, as they're having their babies, their baby boys, it's it's in it's inside them to have their babies circumcised in their in the hospitals and they don't understand these things they haven't been taught these things but somewhere in their Sunday school they've heard about the story and they're embracing it by the spirit they're embracing it they don't really know why but they've decided their children their sons are going to be circumcised and their sons are circumcised they they're not they're not making a this is not something that's been drilled into them, but by the Spirit, they're, they're bending, they're, they're welcoming, they're embracing the word of Yahuwah, and they're saying, I want this for my son. It's a good thing. It's important. It was important to Yahuwah. Um, I, this, this needs to happen. And so many of the Christian sons have been circumcised. So this was by the Spirit. The Spirit called this to happen. Okay. I saw this in Wiki about circumcision. Significantly, the tradition of baptism universally replaced circumcision amongst Christians as the primary rite of passage, as found in Paul's epistle to the Col Colossians and in Acts of the Apostles. Now, I'm reading a quote from Wikipedia, so this is their perspective of what Paul said, and it's also pretty much what we've been taught that Paul said, what has been translated um, as, as being what Paul's point was. If you have been taught that Paul said this is no longer in effect, it's time to start asking some more questions because Yahuwah said it's an everlasting covenant. He said that the person, the male that did not get circumcised was to be cut off from his people. If baptism universally replaced circumcision, then man bought, brought in a tradition to replace the word of Yahuwah. That's not the first time that's happened, by the way. Um, the, the Jews did it a lot. And it would also have been something that failed the test of the false teacher in Deuteronomy 13. Okay, let's look at that real quick. And by the way, it's not just the Jews that um, disobeyed Yahuwah's word and added to and subtracted from but but the other tribes did as well and that's why the northern tribes they left first they were more awful in their idolatry than the tribe of Yehuda was at least at the time that at that time when they had to leave into um, their captivity into Assyria. Deuteronomy 13, this is the test for a true prophet or a false prophet. When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he shall give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder shall come true, of which he has spoken to you, saying, Let us go after other mighty ones, which you have not known, and serve them. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahuwah, your Elohim, is trying you, to know whether you love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being. Walk after Yahuwah, your 
Elohim and fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice and serve him and cling to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams is put to death because he has spoken apostasy against Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim and redeemed you from the house of bondage to make you stray from the way in which Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to walk. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst. When your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend, who is as your own being, entices you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other mighty ones, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the mighty ones of the people which are all around you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, do not agree with him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pardon him, nor spare him, or conceal him. That might sound really foreign, but who's been said, who's been uh, asked, um, well, are you coming over to do an Easter egg hunt with us? Are you coming over to go to Easter Sunday worship service? That is not Yahuwah. But you shall certainly kill him. Your hand is first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from Yahuwah your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage. And let all Israel hear and fear, and not again do any such evil matter as this in your midst. When you hear someone in one of your cities, which Yahuwah your Elohim gives you to dwell in, saying, Some men, sons of Belial, have gone out of you, your, gone out of you, your midst, and led. Let me read this sentence again. Some men, sons of Belial, have gone out of you midst and led the inhabitants of their city astray, saying, "Let us go and serve other mighty ones, mighty ones whom you have not known." Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently, and see if the matter is true, and establish that this abomination was done in your midst. You shall certainly smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, putting it under the ban, and all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword, and gather all its plunder into the middle of the street, and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder before Yahuwah your Elohim, and it shall be a heap forever, never to be built again. And none of that which is put under the ban is to cling to your hand, so that Yahuwah turns from the fierceness of his displeasure, and shall show you compassion." love you and increase you as he swore to your fathers when you obey the voice of Yahuwah your elohim to guard all his commands which i command you today and to do what is right in the eyes of Yahuwah your elohim i'm sharing truth with you and i'm sharing truth in love if you don't want truth and you don't want honesty don't listen to anything that ever comes out of me okay so now we have to talk about something real quick I found this one day, and I had no idea about it. The article was called Brit Milah versus Brit Pariah. Brit means covenant. Mul means circumcised, so that's where they got Milah from. Yahuwah commanded that a very small piece of skin in the front, the foreskin, be cut. It is not total amputation of the skin that is supposed to protect the head of the male member. This is not what Yahuwah commanded. Man changed it according to his own plans, his own fears. I researched it, and I am very upset that this is what is done to the male children whose parents have asked for circumcision for their sons. This is just a gateway to enter into the truth and introduction. Go do your own research. Look up Brit Milah versus Brit Pariah. If you have sons, if you're planning on having grandsons, you need to know about this. Find out if what I am telling you is true. People will stub their big toe on a seat of truth and it becomes the rock of offense because they have not learned of this truth because they were taught a lie. Hey, I was taught lies too. I have five sons. I just ceased believing in these lies when I found out they were false. What are you going to do? For thousands of years, males who have undergone a circumcision have been going under far more than what Yahuwah said to do. Again, men took matters into their own hands, the religious men, and changed what Yahuwah had commanded. But we will look at the definition, and we will look at a comment I found that pretty much summarizes the issue. 
There's far more graphic information here, and I'm just trying to tastefully share what what's the truth without, you know, the pictures and stuff, because you can go research it all. It's all there. In the etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language, mul is the root word found in Genesis 17 for circumcision. It means to circumcise. It also is a conjunction that means in front of, facing, opposite. In the Strong's Concordance, it says that mul means the enemy... Uh, well, we're going to go right here. The enemy has come in to change everything who has called a sign between him and us. The enemy has changed everything. Everything who has said to do, the enemy has come in and changed. And I won't even say that it's all the enemy because Yahuwah says in Deuteronomy 13, as we just read, that he tests us to see if we will, that if we love him with all of our heart. So I believe the enemy has used um, the circumstances to, to uh, divert people from the right path, from guarding the commands. And man's had his own part in letting go of the commands and not guarding them. Man is, is equally uh, <clears throat> culpable in this. Um, and then also Yahuwah says that he would test us to see if we love him with all of our hearts, to see if we're going to guard his commands. So here's the word um, mul, and this is, you can find this at um, Q Bible. Let's see if I have it here real quick. You can find this at qbible.com um, slash Hebrew dash old dash testament. You can find um, the whole word here, all the books, um, the chapters, the verses, and then you can, in the in the website, you can click on a word. Let's say this one's three, two, one, one, born. We can we can hold it right here, and it'll drop down a menu. We can double click on it, and it will open up with a whole Strong's Concordance and lexicon, as we see here, opening up here for us. So we'll go back and look at this word mul. It's number 4135, Mem Wa Lamed. To circumcise, let oneself be circumcised, cut, be cut off. To circumcise, to be circumcised, circumcise oneself. To cause to be circumcised, of destruction, to be cut off, to cut down. A primitive root, the Brown Driver Briggs says, um, a primitive root to cut short, that is curtail, Specifically, the preface that is to circumcise by implication, to blunt, figuratively to destroy. Circumcising selves, cut down in pieces, destroy, uh, must needs. Okay, it's interesting that to be cut off is the consequence for not having your skin cut off. Because Yahuwah said the person's to be cut off if they don't um, have themselves circumcised. Um now, I think I've seen also in some of the Jewish writing that they equated this circumcision in in uh, a sense, not only as a sign, as Yahuwah said, but that they would have some mastery over their the fleshly desires. This is the uh, further information. There's the Strong's Hebrew and Chaldee Dictionary of the Old Testament, and the Strong's Concordance means to circumcise. And it's translated circumcised, circumcised, circumcising, cut off, shafts, and surely be circumcised. It's also translated, that same word is translated as destroy here, and down, and needs, and pieces. I copied this Q Bible site to show you a couple of things. I see himol and yimol when Yahuwah is talking about the circumcision. In verse 13, you can see them together there in the yellow in the middle column. Okay, so this column here has your Hebrew, and it's read from right to left, and here we are in verse 13. So it says, Chimol, Yimol, Yelid, Beitka. So here right here is this transliteration. It can, it'll just help you right along. Chimol, Yimol, Yelid, Beitka, Umiknat Kazpeka Waheta Bariti Babisarkim Librit Olam. And then and then here is roughly a King's 
James translation, but they've put in um, the restored names. He that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must needs. So there's that word. Um, if this if this were the actual um, article, this would drop down in menu. Must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Okay. So Hemol could break down to Himu, them, and Lamed, because there's a, a Lamed, a Lamed actually on the bot, on the end of the letter, the end of the word. Himu, which means them, and Lamed, the last letter, to learn and to teach. Learn it and teach them. Okay, so it is translated, um, I can't tell without it opening up here to me, and it won't because it's not the actual site. Um, chemo, uh, yemo, both of them from the same root, mul, which is to circumcise, but have a different prefix. I may have the meaning down here, let's look, which changes the meaning of the word. Okay. So it is translated, he that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must needs be circumcised. So here's what it is. It is, one of those words means must needs and one of the words means be circumcised. Okay, you got 4135 and 4135. That's the root word mul. So that's the whole point of this. The root word is mul. Okay, to break it down with a Paleo-Hebrew perspective on the meaning, learn it and teach them. Learn it and teach them to be circumcised. So the breakdown for the people, the Hebrew people, why why uh, generations would come along that would not obey Yahuwah is because families would not teach the word of Yahuwah to their children. They would not guard them. They would not guard the covenant, which is what happens today. Where the children are not being taught, and that's why we read about the how awful the latter generation is going to be. Lovers of themselves and liars and stealers and all those things. This is from Wiki on the Covenant of Circumcision. Uncovering Pariah. At the neonatal stage, the inner prepucial epithelium is still linked with the surface of the glands. The mitzvah, or mitzvah, is executed only when this epithelium is either removed or permanently peeled back to uncover the glands. This is the head of the member. On medical circumcisions performed by surgeons, the epithelium is removed along with the foreskin to prevent postoperative penile adhesion and its complications. However, on ritual circumcisions performed by a mohel, the epithelium is most commonly peeled off only after the foreskin has been amputated. This procedure is called paria, which means uncovering, or paria. The main goal of Priya, also known as Bris Pari or Brit Priya, is to remove as much of the inner layer of the foreskin as possible and prevent the movement of the shaft skin, which creates the look and function of what is known as a low and tight circumcision. But when I look up Priya in the Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language by Ernest Klein, it means causing a disturbance and destruction. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like what Yahuwah wanted. He didn't command this Brit Perea. Wiki goes on to say, according to rabbinic interpretation of traditional Jewish sources, the Perea has been performed as part of the Jewish circumcision since the Israelites first inhabited the land of Israel. However, the Oxford Dictionary of the Jewish Religion states that many Hellenistic Jews attempted to restore their foreskins and that similar action was taken during the Hadrianic Persecution, a period in which a prohibition against circumcision was issued. Thus, the writers of the dictionary hypothesize that the more severe method practiced today, more severe method, was probably begun in order to prevent the possibility of restoring the foreskin after circumcision, and therefore the rabbis added the requirement of cutting the foreskin in uh, Perea. Men's good intentions, adding to the commandment, the word of Yahuwah, changing the commandments so that now the circumcision is hated among the Gentiles as being brutal and heinous. The frenulum may also be cut away at the same time in a procedure called phrenectomy. According to Shay J.D. Cohen in Why Aren't Jewish Women Circumcised, 
Gender, gender and Covenant in Judaism, page 25. The Torah only commands circumcision, milah. David Gallaher has written that the rabbis added the procedure of Priya to discourage men from trying to restore their foreskins. Once established, Priya was de deemed essential to circumcision. If the Mohel failed to cut away enough tissue, the operation was de deemed insufficient to comply with Elohim's covenant. And depending on the strictness of individual rabbis, boys or men thought to have been inadequate, inadequately cut were subjected to additional operations. Okay, I think I told you I would share a post, and here it is. When I was reaching this, researching this subject, Brit Mila cutting the foreskin in the front versus Brit Pariah cutting the full covering protective skin, I saw this on a post. This was a, this will give you enough information to start to pause and think on this, to question why men change the commands of Yahuwah. And if they change these commands, what other commands of Yahuwah have been changed? We have to go back and read it. A question for Orthodox Jews. If you somehow do end up restoring your foreskin, do you need to get it re-snipped? Or is having the initial ceremony done the important thing? For an, anyone that knows, during World War II, guys would stretch their skin out to look uncircumcised. Hey, it beat the alternative. Were they, they restoring from a Brit Law? That would be be easy enough, I would think, but to restore from a full circumcision pariah, paria? how realistic does a restored foreskin look in that case? I could see where it wouldn't have to look 100% perfect un under those circumstances, simply more like a foreskin than no foreskin. 2,000 years ago, Jewish Hellenists wanting to assimilate characteristics of the Greek way of life translation, some of them wanted to pass, lol, Anyway, some of them decided to, obliter uh, decided to obliterate the sign of their tip circumcisions, the Brit Milah. Most of their foreskins were still intact, so they found ways to lengthen them to make it look as if they had not been circumcised at all. This practice was unacceptable to ancient rabbis who decided to begin cutting the entire foreskin off in infancy, Perea. The idea being that guys circumcised in this manner could not possibly later hide the fact that they had been circumcised. Ever since Jewish boys have endured and sometimes died from total foreskin amputation, it has even caught on with Gentiles. Go figure. Well, we know why. We already talked about that. Most rabbis today erroneously refer to total foreskin amputation as milah. That is wrong. If somebody has to have a... a if somebody is, is getting a, force, a, a circumcision for their son or grandson, know what milah is and know what it is not. It's just heinous. So this person says they're just curious on this topic. Okay, let's continue reading in Genesis 17. And Abraham said to Elohim, Oh, let, Yisma, let Yishmael live before you. And Elohim said, No, Sarah, your wife, is truly bearing a son to you, and you shall call his name Yitzhak, and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Yishmael, I have heard you. See, I shall bless him, and shall make him bear fruit, and greatly increase him. He is to bring forth twelve princes, and I shall make him a great nation. Yaakov also had twelve sons. But my covenant I establish with Yitzhak, whom Sarah is to bear to you at this set time next year. And when he had ended speaking with him, Elohim went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Yishmael his son, and all those born in his house, and all those bought with his silver, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that same day, as Elohim told him. And Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Yishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Abraham and his son Yishmael were circumcised that same day, and all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with silver from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Soon we're going to read about uh, Paul saying that this covenant with Abraham was established 430 years before 
um, the Torah was given at Mount Sinai or Mount Sinai. Um, and he's going to make a point about the promise, but we need to be aware right here that the, the covenants that were made with Abraham, they included circumcision right then and there, and, and Abraham performed them right then and there. He obeyed Yahuwah. The word says that Abraham obeyed Yahuwah many times. Whatever Yahuwah said, Abraham obeyed. In this chapter, Abram's name is changed to, from Abram, which means father, Abba's father, and exalted, Ram is, fa- is exalted, so you have exalted father in Abram, to Abraham. Now, when he put the hay in the name, it changed to a bar him, or a bar ham. A bar means to fly, to soar, to be strong, and him means they. So they fly, they soar, they are strong. All that happened when Yahuwah put a hay in Abram's name. So next time someone says, why do we have to learn Hebrew? Well, so you know what the little clues like that are, the little codes. Sarai, diminutive, my prince, her name is changed to Sarai, and that means to prevail. So now she's going to prevail and have a child. This name can also be seen in the change of her grandson from Yaakov, heel catcher, supplanter, to Yasarael. See the Sarah there, the Sar? That Sarah. This is a, a Sheen Resh Aleph right here. But sometimes the Sheen Resh Aleph will mean something very similar to the, uh, the Sheen Resh Hay that we see here, which comes from the word Sarah. This this sar here, the prevail here, or sara here, comes from the word sara. Let's look at what the one whom Yaakov wrestled with. So here's one of those drop-down menus I was telling you about. So sara to prevail. Okay, so we see here, if we read this verse, because all of these right across here, they're all 32, 28. And he said, thy name shall be called no more, Yaakov, but Yisrael. For as a prince, Sar is also prince, hast thou power with Elohim and with men and hast prevailed. So here we see this word in Sarit. It says Sarit. So there, this is in Hebrew, this word Sarit that's used here. Um, for as a prince, this is the part right here. 858. 2-0, right here. Okay, for as a prince hast thou power, 8-2-0 is this word here. You see the 8 2 here? Okay, and it's right here as I've pulled it down. Sarit comes from the word sara, and it means to prevail. So he has power, and he prevails. And prince is also the word sar. So these words, sar and sara, and to prevail, These are all here with his new name. So if this is one of our great, 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 great granddaddies, he's a prince, he's a Tsar, and he has this Tsarit, this power to prevail, and he has prevailed. Okay, so that is in our DNA, that we will prevail. Hallelujah. This is just so exciting. The children of Yasserel will prevail. That's our heritage. That's our heritage. Hallelujah. Back to chapter 17. Just such a huge chapter. Let's look at verse 11. There's another word used to circumcise. It's namal. Here it is. We've got 1711. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant. Do you did did you have a token of your covenant? If you're male, this flesh of the foreskin, namal, to become clipped or circumcised. This is not a huge cutting. That, that, that gland's penis is to be covered. And this word is used, and it means to be clipped. And the next word that we want to look at that has been translated as flesh means pudenda of a man. Okay. 
So we've got 1320 here. So the flesh is translated the flesh from its freshness by extension body person, also by euphemism, the pudenda of a man. Okay, so we're talking, since we're talking about circumcision and foreskin, we're talking about the pudenda of a man. You look up that Brit, Brit Milafra versus Brit Pariah, you'll find out there's a whole lot more being cut than the pudenda of a man. Okay, and then we have Orla here, which is prepus. This is 6190, where it says foreskin. We're talking about the prepus. Webster's New World Dictionary on prepus. The fold of skin covering the end of the penis, the foreskin. Okay, we finished chapter 17 now. Um, two covenants, both made by cutting flesh. Okay, we had the one in Genesis 15 where the animals were cut and split in half, and now we have the um, circumcision, which so many people are coming against today because it has been changed. But it is a cutting of skin, and in Yahuwah's mercy, it is not very much skin. Certainly there's pain when whenever the body's cut. You cut your finger, it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. Um, but these are both two covenants, and they are made by cutting flesh. They are also initiated by Yahuwah. Covenants of Abraham. The covenant is cut. So both of these co two covenants that Yahuwah initiated with Abram and Abraham and his descendants were cutting out, were carried out by cutting of flesh. Blood was spilled. Blood was spilled on the stake too. Well, let's keep going. This is a study from Stephen Craner, which I thought was very good. It ties the first covenant in with the renewed covenant. A lot of people call the, and we were trained to call the scriptures that first two-thirds of the book, the fat part, the part that we never went into. Yeah, we called that the Old Testament. It's the first covenant. And the second, we call the New Testament, it's the renewed covenant. Before you ask, I will answer. Abraham's Exceeding Great Reward by Stephen W. Craner. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24. I love to teach about Exodus 12, 40 to 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Yashorel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. <clears throat> And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the host of Yahuwah went out from the land of Egypt. Exodus 12, 40 to 41. The text says that the children of Israel left 430 years on the selfsame day. The selfsame day of what? What happened 430 years previously that was so significant that Israel knew of a certitude that it was the selfsame day? In the United States of America, we have the 4th of July, our Independence Day, the day that the colonies declared independence from the British. This self-same day of Exodus 12, 40-41, must be a day of great significance, perhaps like the declaration of a sovereign state. To answer this question, we go to Galatians 3:17. Now this I say, Torah, that came 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Yahuwah, in Mashiach, so as to do away with the promise. Okay, so we're talking about the Torah cannot annul the promise of the co the covenant and the promise um, given to Abraham. Here, Paul informs us that it was a covenant that was previously confirmed in Messiah 430 years prior to the giving of the Torah instruction from Sinai. So now we have an answer. There was a formal covenant that was confirmed before of Elohim in Messiah on the selfsame day. Paul helps us to know that the words, and to thy seed, occur in the context of this confirmed covenant. The words, thy seed, spoken to Abraham, occur in Genesis 12, 7, 13, verse 15 and 16, chapter 15, verses 5, 13 and 18, and chapter 17, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 21, verse 12, and 13, and 22, verses 17 and 18. And the words are recalled again in Genesis 24, 7. Of all these occurrences, the reference to the making of a covenant occurs in Genesis 15, 18, with the words, unto thy seed. In Genesis 17, 7 to 9, a covenant is referenced but it is the already existing covenant of Genesis 15:18 and context. 
In Genesis 24, 7, Abraham refers to the language or the words recorded in Genesis 15, 18. Yahuwah Elohim of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Abraham, referencing the formal covenant that was made in Genesis 15, states not only that Yahuwah Elohim of heaven spoke to him, but also swear to him, Unto thy seed. But by Abraham's reference to the formal covenant recorded in Genesis 15, we see that Abraham considers that even that event to be the significant promise slash covenant to which he rested his belief. Since Abraham refers back to the covenant event of Genesis 15, we may infer that Abraham made sure that Yitzhak and Yitzhak's seed after him knew about this covenant promise and the date that it occurred. We, could, we conclude that the formal covenant recorded in Genesis 15 is the covenant event to which Paul refers in Galatians 3.17. What is wonderful is that through Paul we learn that the covenant promise of the seed, singular, the Messiah, was made to Abraham on the exact same date as Israel's exodus from Egypt. The new covenant, the renewed covenant, promise of the Messiah to whom the promised land would be given was made on the same date as Israel's exodus from Egypt and on the same date as Messiah Yehushua's death, Messiah our Passover. From this perspective, the new covenant promise was made on the same date as the old covenant was made with literal Israel at Passover. The 14th and 15th of the first lunar month of the Abib of Barley is connected to the renewed covenant before it is connected to the old covenant. In this recent Passover season, while reviewing these scriptures and their teachings to a small gathering for Passover, I noticed something that I had not seen before when I got to actually reviewing the context and details of the actual covenant. It was right at the beginning of Genesis that caught my eye. After these things, the word of Yahuwah came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Adon Yahuwah, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? childless? And the steward <clears throat> of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus, Genesis 15, 1 and 2. For it is very important to know that it is the word of Yahuwah who is speaking to Abram. It is not Yahuwah. This is the same word who became flesh in John chapter 1. The word of Yahuwah is the pre-incarnate Yahushua. Not knowing this, not catching that, it is the word of Yahuwah who is speaking to Abram can cause the reader to miss the truth that I discovered in these two verses. Second, it is very important to know something about ancient suzerain treaties and covenants. In an ancient suzerain treaty and covenant, a minimum of the one carcass of one animal was cut into two halves. Next, the suzerain lord and the suzerain vassal lord would walk back and forth between the divided animals. While walking back and forth between the divided animals, the two covenant makers would discuss the terms of the covenant, including making the formal statement of the vow or oath that consisted the suzerain covenant. In general, the suzerain lord promised to protect the vassal lord and all that were under his lordship and to facilitate commerce for the general welfare of both the suzerain lord and the vassal lord and any other vassal lords. In exchange, the vassal lord covenanted to provide sons, men for the suzerain lord's army, and food and, food and clothing. Comprehending this aspect of the suzerain covenant relationship is important to understanding Abram's statement, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? In Genesis 13:16, Yahuwah had promised that Abram's seed would be as the dust of the earth, so plenteous that no man could number them. In other words, Abram had no son to give to Yahuwah as Abram's suzerain lord for Yahuwah's army. Abram was saying, You promised me children, so many that, one, that no one could number them, but I do not even have one son to give to you for your army. Since I cannot fulfill my part of the covenant, seeing I go childless, how can you fulfill your part of the covenant? What will you give me, seeing I go childless? Not knowing the customs in terms of the ancient suzerain treaties and covenants impairs comprehending these two verses. We have to know the context and the customs of the day. 
In the two verses from Genesis 15, 1 and 2, notice that I emphasize by capitalizing the letters the words reward and give. The Hebrew word that is translated as reward is Strong's H7937, Sakar. Sakar is payment of contract, concretely salary, fair, maintenance, by implication compensation, benefit, higher, price, reward, rewarded, wages, and worth. The Hebrew word that is translated as give is Strong's H5414, Nathan. Nathan means, is a, prim, is a primitive root that means to give and is used with great latitude of application. Take note that in this study I am highlighting these two verses in Isaiah, in, in light of Isaiah 65, 24. Before they call, I will answer. So before you call, I will answer. The only begotten pre-incarnate son of Yahuwah, the one, the word of Yahuwah tells Abram that he, the word of Yahuwah, is Abram's exceeding great reward. And then Abram responds, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? Notice the relationship of childless to the word give. In the idea of reward, or as noted above in the Strong's definition of Sakar, the word of Yahuwah is Abram Sakar, his reward. Another, the Father Yahuwah is the rewarder, and the word of Yahuwah is the exceeding great reward. Here is the Genesis basis of Isaiah's unto us a son is given. Before Abram asked, the word of Yahuwah had already answered. The father's only begotten son, the one, the word of Yahuwah had informed Abram that he, the word of Yahuwah, is, is to be the very son, the seed of Abram, through whom the promise that Abram's seed would be as the dust of the earth would be fulfilled. Because we know that the children of Abram are not necessarily the biological children, but the ones that spiritually are the children of Abram. Abram has children that are physically his children and that are spiritually his children. The word of Yahuwah is the son that is given, rewarded by the father Yahuwah. But more than this, the word of Yahuwah is to be the very son that Abram was to give the father Yahuwah. We know that Abram comprehended this because of his statement after offering Isaac, or Yitzhak, on Mount Moriah. When Abraham was tested as to his willingness to give his only son, Yitzhak, to Yahuwah. Compare Abraham's words to Yitzhak prior to the ascent up Mount Moriah. My son Elohim will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Genesis 22.8 To Abraham's words to Yitzhak after offering the ram caught in the thicket. Abraham called the name of the place Yehua Yireh. In, in the mount of Yehua it shall be seen. Abraham knew that Yehua would himself provide his son. As Abraham had not withheld his son from Yehua, so also Abraham comprehended that Yehua would not withhold his son from Abraham. Yehushua said of Abraham's experience, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. John 8, 5, uh, 56. Okay, let's move on. In Genesis 21, Ab Abimelech's men had seized the well of Abraham, but Abimelech asked Abraham to make a covenant with him to do kindness to him, because he saw that Elohim was with Abraham. Abraham made a covenant with Abimelech, whose name means my father is king, and he gave him seven living ewe lambs to be his witness that Abraham dug the well. His men were fighting over who had dug this well. In Genesis 26, Abimelech's men are grieving Yitzhak, or Isaac this time, and again it is over a well of water. Yet Abimelech sees that Yahuwah is with him, and he asks now the son to make a covenant with him. This time no animals are mentioned. Things get a little crazy when no one has water. What are you going to do if there is no water? Will you dig a well and keep digging until you hit water, like Yitzhak's men had to do? Well, just after Yitzhak entered into this covenant, his men found water in the well. Our last mention in Genesis of a covenant is when Yaakov makes a covenant with his father-in-law. In this instance, they set up a stone pillar vertically and a heap of stones around it to be a witness of their covenant and between them of their covenant. And he also said Yahuwah was to be witness between them. And they covenanted to not pass beyond the stones 
the heap of witness and the standing column of witness to do evil to each other, nor would Jacob take any other wives other than his daughters and their nurses. An offering was made, and they ate it as well as bread. So again, blood was shed at, at their meal here, at their barbecue. And there's also the mention of these two witnesses. When I do the next covenant verses, we will begin in Exodus. And I'm glad we made it through Genesis. There's just so much critical information there. It so applies to us. Even in Genesis 48, 19, um, Jacob tells his son, Yosef, that um, the fullness of the Gentiles will, will be in Ephraim. And Ephraim's like a mascot for the ten northern tribes. Sometimes after the division of the twelve tribes into the southern kingdom of Yehuda, where Benjamin was with him, um, in the northern kingdom, the, ma the mascot of those ten northern tribes is Ephraim, and so it's called in scripture the house of Yashorel, the house of Israel, and it's also called the house of Ephraim. Okay, so also in Genesis 49, Jacob tells his sons, just before his death, what will become of those 12 sons, those 12 tribes in the latter days. I think we've missed that as Christians a lot too. Okay, so we'll start up again with Exodus, um, continuing our study through the word covenant in the, through the Strong's Concordance as covenant shows up. If you're being blessed by this ministry of restoration uh, on the Code Searcher channel, please support our ministry. There are several ways you can help us. Just come over to the www.thecodesearcher.com slash donate, and you'll see the various ways that you can help us. Um, and as we're sharing the restored word of Yahuwah with the world and working the harvest of Yahuwah. And we pray that you are blessed uh, to find the restoration Yahuwah is pouring forth on this latter days generation. And with all that, uh, we wish you good night and shalom.